it seems uh, a long time ago since Jerry said to me in the B-17 hangar at the Air Museum, would you like to tell us all the stories about what you did and where you were in World War II? And I thought what a great honor it was. And thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for breakfast. And I have my wife with me of 64 years, who, like me, grew up through World War II. And, uh, we, we lived in the eastern part of England, um, where the majority of the airfields were, even before the war. So I will try and get on with the slides and see whether we can make some progress. This is the area of England, uh, is the eastern part there uh, of England, very low level land, so it was easy to build the airfields, right there. Where's the signal? Okay. Now, prior to 1939, the British government uh, had a campaign of building new aerodromes, they called them in those days, and they was all permanent buildings. There were something like 35 of them built around the country uh, from the mid-30s onwards. And this is the type of building they put up. This is what they call a C-type hangar. And they went into brick buildings like this. These were magnificent buildings and they built the married quarters for the airmen and so forth. All Georgian type of houses. <coughs> the airfield itself was turf because the airplanes that we had at that time um, didn't need very uh, hard services. However, uh, that soon went away. We had the, the Tiger Moth. We had the Blenheim. I don't know if any of you have seen this airplane, but this is one of the airplanes we had in the beginning of World War II. Of course, our Hawker Hurricane, who doesn't get the publicity it should, and of course, the one that gets all the publicity. Now, this is a battery-operated radio, and my friend is coming here to help me now. Um, we lived right out in the country. No running water, no electricity, anything. So we had a radio, something like this. Um, it had a two-volt uh, lead-acid battery to power the heaters in the valves, or tubes. We mustn't talk about bonnets and hoods, must we? Um, <laughs> and it also had a 110-volt battery to power the amplifier and a grid bias battery, plus an antenna which went out of the back of the set, up through the, the window, 20 feet high, pulled in 60 feet down the backyard to give us a signal. <laughs> and hopefully we can now get the announcement on the, on the video. Whilst we're waiting for that, this was in our little living room and our neighbours joined us and they just stood around waiting for this broadcast. And I can tell you that was a moment that I will never ever forget. The, the people were there, they were very, very sad and staring at each other. And when the speech had finished, I remember my poor old mother, she clapped her face in her hands and tears were dripping on the floor. And she said, oh, no, not again. They had already weathered the World War I bombing of the Zeppelins over East Anglia. Are we able to get it? Can you find it? It's, if you reduce that, it's down in the corner. That one there. This one? Yeah. Oh, perhaps we'll leave it out. Yeah, let's bypass it. Is it? Yeah. Because uh, they they had suffered uh, during World War One. My parents uh, were living in that area too. I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin and then the German government That's great. the final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland the state of war would exist between us. That's good. 
Thank you. <coughs> Can you give me that control, please? I forgot to ask, are there any World War II aircrew with us as modern pilots with us? Oh, good. Where were you based? I was in the Pacific. Oh, he's in the Pacific. You didn't come to our cold country then, where we had plenty of warm beer for you. How are we doing that? Okay. Right, as soon as that announcement was made, we were given lots of instruction of what we had to do. The first thing we had to do was to black out all light coming out of the windows or doors or anything. Also, the vehicles had to have headlight masks on, like top hats with slits in them. Parking lights were permissible. And the, the blackout time was portrayed all over the place with the, uh, with the airway wardens. There's a couple there, I think they're enjoying putting up the blackout lights. <laughs> and they painted the curbs on the street black and white so that people didn't fall over them. All the windows, we had to strap, strap them with paper tape or cloth tape glued to the panes of glass to avoid any shattering of glass to try and avoid. Now, this is the big thing was gas masks. We was all issued with a gas mask very shortly after the war started, so they had them all ready. The babies were issued with a little crib which had a pump on the side with a filter on, and so they put the baby inside and the mother had to pump the air in through the filter. Over six months old they had a Mickey Mouse type of uh, gas mask, but the rest of us had to wear this thing and I think Joan will tell you that we can still smell that rubber that when they come to fit it because they fitted them onto you and they put a block on the end of the filter to make sure there wasn't any air coming in the side. We had to carry them in our carrying case wherever we went. There was a great possibility of Germans using gas because they did in the First World War. And the other thing we was issued with, not plastic in those days, but a, a similar sort of material uh, to cover ourselves just in case they used the mustard gas, which you know burns the skin. And although the siren would go to say the enemy aircraft were close or overhead, the wardens had to go out with the gas rattle, one of the old wooden rattles to inform you that there was likelihood of gas. We also had to build our own shelters because we was likely to get bombed and in fact uh, they, they was over our area within a short time bombing some of the airfields. And so we first of all built our own shelter, dug a great big hole in the ground and so forth, but eventually they delivered us what was known as a Morrison shelter. Um, you put it up, uh, you assembled it in your ground floor room. They threw it over your front yard and you had to pick it up, bring it in and assemble it. And it was an 8 by 4 sheet of um, metal supported on these uprights here. And of course you can see we had to sleep in there quite frequently. The other type was the Anderson shelter, which was often put in the backyard and covered over with soil or concrete or whatever was available. And you can see the little ones inside there. Identity cards. Believe it or believe it not, it's not something you have to have in the UK even up to today as an identity card. But when war broke out, they had to give everybody an identity card. It was all printed on a blue background and it had a watermark in it to make sure it was genuine. It, the local district councils came round with their uh, register and they went to each house and they would give you a registration number, the number of uh, letters and the number of your house and that was the third person in the house and her name was Corrie, uh, her surname was Corrie and, and Doris and she moved three times. They had to be stamped every time she moved. Now, when the war finished, they dropped the identity cards, and they've never been reissued. 
<laughs> this is another factor in our ration books. Our ration of meat for one week was four ounces. When I'm in the Air Museum and I have some of the high school kids come around and talk to them about uh, rations, and I ask them to go to, next time to go to McDonald's and get a quarter pounder, look at that piece of meat in there and just think, when I was a kid, that's why I didn't grow up. <laughs> that's, that's all that we had to eat for a week. Uh, mind you, we did live in the country, so we was able to use rabbits and uh, chickens and that sort of thing. But everything was on ration. Everything. Even clothes and even furniture. Even when Joan and I got married in 1952, we had to use coupons to buy furniture for our first house. It, was still, it went on that long. <coughs> of course, got this one in there. Royal Observer Corps. These guys um, were a, a service, but not a service, you know, it was sort of like your Coast Guards. They was on the, all the high points around the, mainly around the east coast of England, and they was observing <coughs> the aircraft coming in and they was warning which area they was heading for, how many they were. It was all done by telephone, <coughs> landline telephone. We had nothing else at that time. This guy, as you see, is standing on the roof in London. This is briefly what they were looking for along that coast there. And of course, we also had that old-fashioned radar stuff uh, put up. And the towers for that <coughs> radar equipment were wooden towers, lattice towers. They stood something like 300 feet and they was all around those places around the east coast. One of the fighter pilots going for his. <coughs> the other thing we had to do was to take down all the road signs in the village, towns and villages, because they thought if the Germans landed there, they would be able to read the signs and know where to go. That was one of the, I think, rather silly things, but it had to happen. <coughs> There's a guy he's carrying London. <laughs> and there they are all parked up, uh, ready for to be demolished. Now, of course, 1940 saw the Blitz. The uh, majority of people think the Blitz was restricted to London. This is not quite true, because most of the major cities in England uh, were bombed. Not as bad as London, obviously, but, uh, of course, they was intent on getting all the young children out of London to safer areas, and the operation was called the Pied Piper. And here they are, streaming down the railway stations, getting on the trains and going to Scotland and the west coast of England, and some of them even came to America and Canada. This was 1940, when the British Expeditionary Force were forced out of France. I think you'll probably remember that. <coughs> it, they was evacuated when France gave up all the white flag. And these are all the boats that are going across the channel to pick up the troops. There was something in the region of four or five hundred thousand troops to get back to England. And here they are, bedraggled, coming back, completely demoralized. And this was the queues, or the lines, I have to say, in America, uh, of waiting to get onto the boats. And this boat, as you see, just a few people on board there. And here they are again. Now, this was the time when Hitler did us a favor. He didn't follow them. He went the other way, didn't he? And the morale in England at that time, I can assure you, was at its lowest. Really was. If, if he'd have come across then, I think he probably would have toppled us over. We would have resisted, of course, but... Um, there we go. Now, the, the women also played their part in the war. They had a women's land army, and they could either join that or join the... Uh, Army, the Air Force, or the Navy. 
And there they are on the field, okay, cutting off sugar beet. Now the Battle of Britain, of course, came a little bit later in 1940. I think that's been well documented, documented and I'm sure the majority of, of you have read all about that. So I'm not going to dwell on that. But that was a significant point in a war, of course, that we were able to overcome the, the, the Luftwaffe. There was the guys running onto the field. See, still grass airfields. This was down in Biggin Hill in Kent. And there's our famous Spitfire. As I tell people in the Air Museum, that's the best airplane we've got in there. Not everybody believes me until they hear them English. And then they tell me that the P-51 was better. And I said, yes, you're right. Once we made it work, we put it better. <laughs> so I, I get, my, get my own back with the American people. In the this is probably something you haven't seen before. Um, there was uh, satellite and searchlight batteries all the way around the country. Um, this is a searchlight here, uh, an arc search, oh sorry, I didn't mean to go that far. Uh, and a unit called sounders. Um, these sounders could be direction finders for where the aircraft were coming in. And if there was a steady drone of an airplane, they could pick it up. And when they picked it up, they gave the directions to the searchlight guys. The searchlight guys got the the airplane in their sights, and then they had artillery there which opened fire on them. All very, very technically right, but it didn't always work. Of course, as I said, there was blitz in various places. This is our local city, Norwich, or as most Americans call it, Norwich. Um, that's our city. That was heavily bombed because there was a lot of munition factories in the city. See the double-decker bus in the hole there? Another interesting point here, this is uh, known as a parachute bomb. It's, um, it's about six, uh, six feet long, two feet in diameter, and it was carried by the Dorniers, and they dropped it over England with three huge parachutes on. Um, and the idea of that was for it to explode at the point of time it hit the roof of a building or about 30 feet in the air. So the blast went outwards instead of upwards like the high, high intensity bombs did. Uh, fortunately, we had one land in our village and me as a little lad going to the dairy to get the milk in the morning cycled past this thing, and when I got to the dairy, the lady said to me, you didn't come past the lily bits, did you, Sonny? I said, yes, I did. You mustn't go back that way, because there's a big bomb there. She said, you must go home the other way. But which way did I go? <laughs> I had to go and take a look at it. But then we was all evacuated from our houses, because if that exploded, it uh, cleared an area about a quarter of a mile. So we were evacuated for three days whilst they made it safe. Now, 1942, we're coming on to airfield construction ready for the American Army 8th Air Force. But between 1939 and 42, we had been building many, many airfields. But because the American Air Force was coming, uh, Army Air Force was coming over, the British government sent out their surveyors to our area to commandeer land for the airfields. And they would commandeer something like two, three hundred acres of ground. And our area is one of the best uh, agricultural areas in England, and they was producing a lot of food. And there was animosity between the British people and the British government for taking all this land away, which was producing food. However, they came along, and this is in my village. The airfield was called Wending, but the village I lived in was called Beeston. It's only because the actual runways were in the village of Wending and got called up, Station 118. And there's the finished job. 
three runways, 6,000 for the long runway, 4,200 for the other ones. And the main runway was always in the direction northeast, southwest, or well, thereabouts, prevailing winds. And the majority of the time, we had B-24s on our base, they used the main runway. You can also see there were hangars and refilled spots. But when they was building it, there was an order came out to install a further 30 hard stands because they wanted to up the amount of aircraft they had here. And eventually, we had 50 B-24s based there. Uh, this, is, uh, this is by courtesy of the Air Museum. And if you haven't been into the Air Museum to see it, uh, Greg Kelly told me that if I use that, I've got to ask you to go to the Air Museum. <laughs> So this is the American Army 8th Air Force, okay? Um, those names in white is where the B-17s were based. Those in gold was where the B-24s were based. I think there's a 41 in all. And I worked on that one there. Wendling, 392nd Bomb Group with four squadrons of B-24s. The interesting thing here is that each of these airplanes needed something like 2,000 gallons of gas to go on one of the missions across to Germany. In England, we had no gas. So the gas all had to come either from the States or from the Middle East to the west coast of England, where it was uh, refined, and then it had to find its way to all these little <coughs> places in the villages, little village roads. So it was the little tankers, trains, and all sorts of vehicles delivering gas to these stations. And on each station we had two installations with six 3,000 gallon tanks, English gallons, and the little trucks would be filling up the top whilst the refillers would be there. <laughs> we want all this for our airplanes. Now occasionally it didn't all get through, so 45 gallon barrels of 100 octane were delivered frequently on, on deck and they would be stored in the gas installations every once in a while. You see 20 or 30 guys out there filling the tanks from 45 gallon barrels to keep things going. The uh, B B-17s used to take off first in the morning because most of their raids were, were day raids and in the summertime it would be four or five o'clock in the morning they would be taking off and then the B-24s would follow and they would have to climb out up to 20,000 feet. Uh, to see these guys coming out of the briefing room in the trucks with their 50 caliber guns with the waste gunners and the, the uh, turrets, uh, you see them carrying those and there would be the guy who was carrying the Norden bomb site. To see those men going onto those trucks and out to the airplanes getting ready to fly out, which we did quite frequently because we were working on the airfield most of the time. The, uh, <coughs> they would go out to the dispersals, they'd have their last cigarette, you would see some of them on their knees and they would get into the airplane and then they would all taxi out to the end of the runway, both sides of the perimeter track, and to see that many airplanes taxiing to the end of the runway uh, was fantastic. But more than that, when they got up into the air, uh, they had to use a climb out pattern. And you saw how close those bases were, and they had to climb up mainly through cloud because England didn't have wall to wall sunshine. And they had to climb out. And so these are the patterns that they had to climb out on in adverse weather conditions. And unfortunately, no radar was available in those airplanes at the time. And there was occasionally the mid-air collision. This is the group that we had, the 392nd Bomb Group. There are the B-24s with letter D. <coughs> this is a picture I put in here, <coughs> just for interest's sake. It's at the Ford factory, and I'm told that they produced one B-24 every 75 minutes. Fantastic, isn't it, when you think of it? Now, this is as the brief, as the uh, operations room is 
today, um, these pictures are where I was able to get uh, being used as a uh, agricultural instrument uh, repair bay. There's the guys you could see they was living uh, very close to the people in the village. There's a little house there. There's the security fence. What about that? Talk about increasing security bomb springs airport, don't we? There's the security fence. <laughs> Always washing the Johnnies out. Two of the guys having fish and chips on a bomb site in Norwich in newspaper wrappings. Very traditional. And this is the sort of thing you'd see on, on the sites where the guys were living. This is the combat officer's mess. And I don't know if you can see it, but can you see all the bicycles? main mode of transport. The buildings were four and a half brick wall, that's all they were, and they had to have these staunchions every um, casements you call, every once in a while to stop the walls collapsing, and they had a asbestos sheet roofs. Can you imagine that? This is the bomb dump at Wendy, which was in a wooded area, and so they was able to put the, the netting over the top of them. All these bomb dumps had to have lightning conductors in to prevent any strike from London, uh, from lightning. These are the Nissen or concert huts, as you call them, where the guys lived. Uh, there would be about 30 guys in each one of these huts. They had three lights down the center and one five amp socket outlet. Can you imagine them all wanting to play their record players or play a radio or something like that? Talking about record players, of course they brought them over and didn't realize that we only had 50 cycles and not 60, so <laughs> they didn't really get a good tune out of them, but we was able to convert some of them so they was nearer the correct speed. Very popular man I was at that time, or a boy. This was right in the middle of our airfield, um, Mr. Scott's farm, and they allowed this man to stay in that farm for the whole of the war time that they was there. Um, he had a barn there where he used to have chickens and uh, he used to do a great trade in selling eggs and so forth to the, the guys. These are the technical buildings right close to the airfield. What I didn't tell you earlier, why they had to take so much land was that it was only the technical buildings that were built close to the airfield itself. The bomb dump was remote and the areas where the guys lived, the domestic accommodation, was well away from the airfield to avoid any um, problems when they bombed the airfield, which they did. There's the hospital ward, which was very, very busy when the airplanes came back. Another briefing room there. They didn't have much shelter when they was repairing the airplanes because the airplanes came back in the afternoon and they had to set to and repair them ready for them to go next morning. There was hardly any buildings around the, the hard standings and so the bombs came over in a box of six and so all the boxes, <coughs> the bombs came in were used to make the shack so they had a little place to keep warm. A little stove there, they had a little stove inside there to keep the place warm. This was the flight planning office, not quite like some of you use today. Briefing room with all the maps on the wall. Another shack made of bomb boxes. And this was an unfortunate accident. One of the airplanes caught fire on a Saturday evening and it was right next to one of the gas installations I was talking about earlier. And fortunately, the fire department did a wonderful job keeping those tanks cool whilst the, they let the aircraft burn out. Of course, metal ceremonies. 
This is the runway control van. I don't know whether you who've been in the American Air Force, whether they still use them, but uh, during the war they had this caravan at the end of the runway. They would uh, check on the airplanes to see which ones were going off, to see that everything was okay, there was nothing loose or there was no problems or keeping the vehicles off of the perimeter track. Um, they used uh, red and green lights for controlling the vehicle traffic and they also had constant contact with the control tower. Uh, this was down at the little railway station.